class. This is your first lecture on Ishmael by Daniel Quinn, uh, one of the most famous books out there. It's, uh, one of the few books that really changes you as a person if you read it. And I think that it is the most important book in the world right now if we're going to save ourselves, the planet, and every species on the planet from extinction. Okay, If you have no idea what I'm talking about, then uh, uh, you're part of the problem. So, you know, it's time to perk your ears up and start paying attention to some things going on in the world. All right. So if you'll notice, written here at the top is section one. The book is divided into, I think, 14, 13, 14 sections. And each section has little mini chapters in it. Okay, now before we even get started, what you have to understand about this narrator and why he or she, I guess they kind of give him a default he pronoun, but, you know, really he's supposed to be kind of, you know, lacking in identity so we can plug ourselves in. The narrator is supposed to be kind of a metaphor for us. So this book functions on what you call the Socratic method, where you have a teacher and a pupil who engage in critical thinking through conversation and back and forth dialogue. The book is written in this way so that you will be engaged in that manner as well. All right? One thing that you have to understand about the narrator is the narrator grew up in the 60s and 70s, and you guys might not know much about the revolution of the 60s and 70s. I'm sorry about that here. Uh, but essentially, it was a revolution that was designed to for the people of the world to break away from civilization. It was an open revolt against civilization. The idea was to return to nature, to get rid of the evils of money and institutions like church and government and education, and to take a more holistic approach to doing things, and to value life and each other and living things again. Uh, ultimately, it failed and uh, was destroyed by civilization. Many of its leaders assassinated, uh, like John Lennon of the Beatles, for example. And so essentially this narrator is kind of has this emotional response to this you know, ad in the paper because he likens it as being locked in the friend zone. Like, you know, you've been wanting this revolution for so long, you've been wanting this knowledge for so long, and then all of a sudden somebody comes, uh, you know, to, to tell you they can tell you how to save the world. So you can imagine, like, you know, you're locked in the friend zone, then all of a sudden somebody knocks your door and it's like, you're always what I wanted, come with me. And you're like, what? You know, so that's the kind of skepticism he has. Now, there's several, anytime you have the first chapter of a book, all the main themes are presented. The idea of the self, the idea of the teacher and moving beyond the teacher to become your own teacher. Um, the idea of false promises to save the world, often tied up in, you know, guru gimmicks and, uh, you know, religions. And um, <clears throat> that's why the guy has such a response to this. But, uh, but anyways, but the, some of the other themes are the idea of captivity, the idea of imprisonment, the idea of language, and the idea that we all live our lives by a story. And if you live your life by a false story, then you will have a flawed life. Um, and that some of the stories we live ourselves by are concocted. Okay. Now, when he gets to the office building, it is a normal everyday office building which suggests that the answers to our problems would be found in the normal everyday. All right. uh, if you'll notice the books and objects in the room, the books and objects in the room are uh, important. They're foreshadowing what will come later. And you have to ask yourself, you know, why, why a gorilla? Why is a gorilla here? What does that have to do with anything? Well, just so you know, a gorilla is one of the things that we are most closely related genetically to the, to the gorilla. We share 98.6% of our DNA with a silverback gorilla. 
And in many ways, a gorilla is kind of like an early version or a, represent, or a repre representation of our past selves when we humans were uh, pre-language and when we lived uh, pre-language in troops and tribes you know, all over this, this country, uh, just like the gorilla did, living completely in nature. And one of the reasons, if you'll notice, when he looks, uh, first looks into the glass, he sees his own eyes. Now, that's a common thing in, in literature. Anytime you talk about reflection or eyes or anything like that, it's about self-reflection. It's about uh, overcoming some aspect of yourself. It's about realizing things about the self. And the eyes are, of course, the window to the soul. Now, this, uh, with man gone, will there be gorilla, um, is what you call a, oh, I forgot, a cone, I believe, K-O-A-N, or Kona. And um, I'll have to look it up just to, to check. But, but anyways, it, it's basically something that can be answered two different ways. You know, with humans gone, will there be any hope for gorilla? In other words, if we're going to extinct, will gorillas thrive? Or... With humans gone, will that be also the downfall of a gorilla? Will we go out at the same time? And so it's supposed to make you kind of think about this. Now, the gorilla speaks to the narrator telepathically. And again, all this stuff is metaphor. You know, uh, again, it's the idea of some buried part of our past self speaking to our future self. And it starts to set up themes of, Humans before civilization versus humans after civilization. Leavers versus takers. Uh, those are the terms he uses for, for primitive people. Leavers and people of civilization takers. And so these two aspects of humans, the gorilla and the narrator, represent those things. And that's going to keep going you know, throughout the book. And, um, okay, all right. So uh, we get into a number of things here, and in this section here with the tiger and the gorilla, we come across the idea of language acquisition and the self. For instance, there is a whole you know, sect of scientists who believe that the idea of religion and gods was all kind of created when humans first gained, uh, first gained language. And... Humans first began, began to get names for things like valley, river, mountain, you know, stuff like that, food, apple, orange. And uh, then all of a sudden humans were confronted with an issue. Hey, we're out of food here. What should we do? And then all of a sudden a thought pops in their head and words for the first time. Um, you know, we should go to the next valley. So go to the next valley. And all of a sudden, you know, humans thought those were the gods talking to them when really... They were hearing their own voices in their heads in language for the first time because you have to understand animals don't think in words, they think in emotion, which is why like if you ever tried to help an injured animal, it oftentimes attacks you because it can't think in concepts like he is helping me or she is helping me. It can only think hurt, 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 you know, pain, 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 just the emotion and not even the word. So at some point we gain words and what are the implications of that to our identity as people? So, for instance, uh, you know, uh, Ishmael compares himself, you know, to the Jews uh, and uh, humans, to Nazis that come and killed his entire troop and took him away to a zoo. And one of the things that he mentions is uh, kind of an idea uh, that we have in Game of Thrones at the end of this uh, paragraph at the top. Uh, you know, what is more powerful, one or five? And, you know, and most people would say five, but... Really, it's one. You know, a curled fist is way more powerful than an open hand of five fingers. You know, one fist is more powerful than five severed fingers. Uh, the idea that uh, at one point we were one, we were a unit. Our thought was uh, a thought that was all, uh, our thinking was, you know, concerned with us as a community. We are one. We are human. We are a troop. And as we became individuals, we became like severed fingers, only aware of our own identity. As we develop language, we break away from the collective and become more about the self. And um, so, you know, that's, you know, so, you know, that's kind of what's behind this, this whole idea of language acquisition. Now, the Nazis and the, uh, the Jews, 
they're going to be a metaphor for pretty much for us. You know, we are like the Nazis, the way we slaughter all other species on this planet. Uh, and that's why uh, the writer has, you know, um, you know, the writer has Ishmael being saved by, by uh, you know, a Jewish man, Mr. Sokolow, who's a survivor of the Holocaust. And he tells him, you're not Goliath, you're Ishmael. Now, again, this is the idea that name and identity can inform who you are as a person and the way that you think. But one thing you might not realize is that Ishmael, uh, Ishmael is actually the firstborn son of Abram, who later becomes Abraham. And what you have to understand about the Old Testament is a lot of that, st a lot of the names, and a lot of the Old Testament are allegories. They're they're stories that you get one way, but they have a whole second meaning, especially if you understand the names in the original language that the Old Testament was compiled in. You know, it was taken from like Hittite and Semite and all these other tribes and the ancient Hebrews, you know, compiled it all together in ancient Hebrew, like, you know, 50, 60,000 years later. And what you know is the ancient Hebrew Bible, which later becomes the Christian Old Testament with a lot of heavy changes. Um, so if, just so you know, uh, Ishmael's Mother was Hagar. She was a slave. Uh, Abram wasn't able to get um, Sarah pregnant. Uh, and uh, Abram, uh, you know, instead uh, has a child by Hagar. And uh, Hagar means to flee. And Ishmael, their son, uh, means uh, the one who know. let's see, the one who knows the word of God. Now, Ishmael was born hairy and wild. And when Isaac was born of Sarah... They would often fight, and Isaac was smooth-skinned, uh, less hairy, and a little bit more intellectual and less wild than than um, than Ishmael. And so, what you begin to see here is a comparison. And what you what you may not realize is a lot of the Old Testament and the ancient Hebrew Bible is, especially the first five books of the Bible, are the story of leavers versus takers. Ishmael represents the leavers. Isaac represents takers. And by the way, Isaac. Son of Sarah means uh, he who laughs. Okay. Now Ishmael gets thrown out into the wild. He's given a piece of bread and some water. And Ishmael and Hagar are sent and they become a tribe out in there. And, you know, uh, so, you know, this thing's a metaphor for different tribes in, in the old part of the world. And Isaac ends up staying, you know, with uh, Sarah and Abram becomes Abraham because now he's the father of many tribes. And, you know, he has Rachel, which means the lamb. And, you know, all these names have meaning. But what you're going to start to see is a battle between people of nature and people of civilization. And all the people in the Old Testament are broken up that way. Okay? So you can kind of see how the gorilla is called Ishmael because, you know, he's been forced out of his home as well. Okay? Um... All right, let me get down a little bit more. Now, this part here is extremely important because it talks about the idea of captivity. And one of the things that you guys could probably agree with, especially if you answer these same questions, is are you a prisoner and what are you a prisoner of? You know, uh, we're all in a prison, kind of like the Matrix, uh, of a, a prison with bars that we can't see. So what exactly are we prisoners of? And, and again, if I ask you guys, you know, who amongst you wants to destroy the world, the whole entire class would probably say none of us. And then I would say, well, then why do you and why won't you stop? And you probably don't have a good answer for it. Well, this book is trying to give you that answer and trying to give, answer the question of what are you a prisoner of? Okay. So we move on to this paper about Hans and Kurt. And the whole idea is that Hans and Kurt, Hans and Kurt are um, there in New Tokyo. That the premise of this paper is that the Germans and Hitler won World War II, and they've conquered the entire world. So as you can, you know, kind of assume, uh, one of the things they do is get rid of anybody who's not German and white. So pretty much everybody's dead but white Germans. And then, uh, just like our own government does in any government, you fill your school systems with the history that you want your students to learn. So Kurt and Hans grew up thinking 
that there is no such thing in the world other than Germans. The world has always been filled with Germans. In fact, they don't even know that they're in Japan. They think it's New Germany. And they think Tokyo is like New Heidelberg or, you know, New, New Berlin or something. And then Hans turns the curtain and says, you know, look, I can't shake this crazy feeling that there's something we're all being lied about. So what I'm trying to tell you is that you, class, you are Hans or Kurt. You're either oblivious and you don't know that the entire history of the world has been erased before you and you think you know what came before, or you're either, you know, the other one and you think, mm, I think we've been lied about something. Well, this book is going to tell you what you've been lied about, what history has been erased before you. Okay? All right. So one of the things he asked about in section two is, how did Hitler rise up to be Hitler? And they go through a series of questions. Then he finally says, look, Hitler had a story. And so what you have to understand is, after World War I, Germany took the full blame for all of World War I, and they were given the bill for it. And they had to pay for the entire war for every country. And this completely decimated their economy. I don't know if you can imagine. Imagine you go to the grocery store to buy you know, a gallon of milk, which is normally like $2, and then all of a sudden that gallon of milk costs $200 because your currency is worthless. You know, that's what happened here in the South after the, the Civil War. The currency became worthless. So imagine you can't pay your bills, you can't pay your bank bill, you can't pay anything, right? And you lose your business, you lose your property, you lose everything. And so what you have to understand is that the German people survived every major empire that existed. So they've maintained their own land and their own language for thousands of years. Okay? And so after World War I, their economy shot, and then all of a sudden these foreign invaders start coming in and buying up all the property that they've had in their family for hundreds or thousands of years. So if you can imagine, you know, some foreigner comes, you know, to Georgia and then all of a sudden, you know, buys up your land that's always been yours because, you know, out of your control, the economy shot, then you're, you know, a, a good solution is, hey, this is ours. We don't deserve to lose it. So let's fight and kill these people. Let's round them up and kill them. And that was the story that Hitler gave the German people. They said, we don't deserve this. This is ours. People are taking it. And God has said that we are supposed to run the world, that we are his chosen people. And that's a hell of a story for people who are desperate. And they believed it. And the ones who didn't believe it were locked up or killed. And then once they started teaching it in school, and once they got kids to rat on their parents who didn't believe it and those parents went missing, you either went along with the stampede or you got killed by the stampede. And that was the story that Hitler gave, right? It had a beginning, middle, and end. And we also have been given a false story, a beginning, middle, and end. And um, no matter where you go, that story is being whispered in your ear from the minute you're born. Okay? So, uh, you know, this is where we get the definition of levers and takers. People pre-civilization and people post-civilization. And we get some this other question. How did things come to be this way? What is the story that we're being told? Okay, so he gives you some definitions here. A story is a scenario that interrelates in the man, the world, and the gods. Whatever god or gods you believe in. Okay? The second definition you're given is to enact. And that's where you live your life as to make a story a reality. And I know you guys may be thinking, oh, how can you do this? Well, look at Hitler. He created a story that had to do with Germans, humans, God, and our role and their role on the earth. And he made that story come true to the point that, you know, nine million people were executed. Okay, so culture is people who are living in a way and acting a story, a scenario about themselves and the gods that make it come true. So you have to kind of ask yourself, what is our culture? What is our story? And is it a true story? Is, you know, okay. All right. So what we're looking for and what he challenges the narrator to do is 
to come up with the premise. How did things come to be this way? Let's start with the beginning. So, you know, uh, what is the beginning of the Taker story? All right. And that's where we leave off.